That sounds like a testament and a declaration. Yes, yes, yes. folk are doing you wrong and fighting against you, you don't run. I don't know if we have any military folk with us. There's no such thing as retreat. Amen. And even in the Bible, where they say put on the whole armor of God, there is no back covering. There's only forward covering. Amen. I'm going to stay on the battlefield. Amen. We got to learn to hang in there even though it gets tough. It's going to get tough. But we got to hang in there. Amen. Because behind us is goodness and mercy. And the Lord is still our shepherd regardless of what come with me. Amen. But I want to treat everybody. I want to treat everybody right. Everybody means Lottie Dottie and everybody. Everybody means big, tall, short, then it, it means everybody, white, black, uh, brown, yellow, whatever. It means I'm going to treat everybody right. That's that's what we just saying. That, that's your declaration. That's your commitment as a soldier in the army of the Lord. Amen. Well, it's preaching time. We um, we're going to lift up Hebrews chapter 11, verses 1 through 3. I know some of y'all are saying, we've probably been here before. I don't know anybody that could preach the gospel that's never been here before. Amen. Isn't that right, preachers? Amen. You pretty much can't preach and teach unless you come past Hebrews 11. Amen. Hebrews 11, they say the author is unknown. Some have ascribed it to Paul. It does not have, for me, it does not have all of the uh, Paul characteristics. Um, but in some cases, some theologians believe it does belong to Paul. Where I've come to realize that it's the gospel. It doesn't matter who wrote it. It's still good news. Amen. Amen. 
So find, here we find these words recorded. And now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtain a good report. Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that things which are seen were not made of things which do appear. Can I just read that, those three one more time? I know my time is short today, but it just sound good. Now, faith is the subject of things hopeful, the evidence of things not seen. For it, for by it, meaning by faith, the elders obtain a good report. Yeah. What's on your report card? Through faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which are seen, folks, were not made of things which do appear. Heavenly gracious fathers, in the name of Christ Jesus, that we do thank you, we praise you, we glorify you, we thank you, Lord God, for this is another opportunity to hear and to receive your word, Lord God. We study, but we sort of still need your strength. Entangle me, Lord God, in your word. You use me as your ready scribe, that your word will go forth. Powerful than each which is so in Christ Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. We'll tag this text. Again, we've come this far by faith. As I've said before, and it's not my quote, but it it's certainly appropriate. Faith that fizzles was faulty from the start. Faith that fizzles was faulty uh, from the start. So when it comes to faith, we must understand and we must look at it beyond its basic teaching and learn behavior uh, because most of our faith and understanding of our faith is based it on traditionalism. Is what we've heard. Is what has been taught to us. We've heard it in songs. We've heard the preachers preach about it. And, and that really amounts to just traditionalism. We know enough about it to say, I've heard about faith before. But faith must be a place where it transforms our life into a personal relationship with the impossible, uh, which means that we start to live in things that are now impossible because we serve a God that makes all things possible. Uh, so the transformation that must occur to really understand what faith is, and we must surrender ourselves and surrender our will and surrender our willpower and to go through this transformation where we accept and say, it's in your hands. I don't know how, I don't know when, but I know you can. That's right. That's right. So many of us we call faith hope. Uh, and the problem with that is that it doesn't take much uh, to believe with hope. Uh, because hope is simply something that you can see in many cases. I, I, you're standing at the bus stop and a bus is coming and you say, I hope. That's my bus. You at the subway and the lights start blinking and you see the train come and you're like, I hope that's my train. You've had indication that something is on the way. So that's not faith. That's simply just hoping. Uh, you see uh, the mailman put the mail in the box. He said, I hope my check is in the box. 
you see something happening. Mm. Uh, but faith is where you are able to say, I didn't see anything. I have no indication. I, I have no earmarking. I, I have nothing to go on, but be able, uh, able to say, I know he can, and I know he will. Uh, hope has no real relevance in the realm of impossibility. Uh, because Paul even intimated this when he tried to show us uh, the fallacy of operating with just hope and not faith. It was Paul that said to the church at Rome in Romans 8.24, he says, for we are saved by hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. Uh, for what a man seeth, why do he yet hope for, but we hope, but if we hope for that which we see not, then do we with patience wait for it. And how many of you can say you've operated in the patience of waiting? You've asked God to move. You've asked God to bring. You've asked God to deliver. You've asked God to lift. You've asked God for various things. And when he does not move fast enough, we, we step outside of the realm of patience and we make things happen, and we only make a mess of those things. We know that in the hall of faith, uh, we see the name written uh, Abram or Abraham, and we see that Abraham made it uh, to the hall of faith. But Abraham did not always operate in faith, because he stepped outside of the faith of God. He stepped outside of the and he decided he was going to make what God told him come to pass. You can't make what God tells you to come to pass. God says you're going to be the father of many nations, but he looked at his condition. Church faith should cause you not to look at your condition, but he looked at his condition, and his condition is I'm old. And Sarah, she's old. I'm old. Sarah's old. There was no Viagra and see how this back then. They just looked at the situation and said it's impossible. But Abraham decided he was going to help God by saying, uh, I'm going to go ahead and use one of the handmaids. And, I'm going to go ahead and help God out because God does not understand the current situation. How many times have you stepped outside of the will of God because you didn't feel God understood your current situation, changed jobs, changed uh, relationships, got married, or did things that God did not tell you to do, but he promised you? He doesn't need us to make it happen. He needs us to simply trust and wait on him to make it happen. And because of what Abraham did, uh, we now have a person by the name of Ishmael. Ishmael is the reason we are at war today with the Taliban and the Muslim faith that, that are non-God-loving individuals. His mistake we are still dealing with today because he didn't have the patience. How many of us are moving without the hand of God? So Paul wants us to know that don't move just because you can see, well, I see Abraham's I see she's at the church, she's in the childbearing years. And my boo Sarah, she's not. So I see it. So I, my 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 hope is now in my handmaid. But again, I can have a teaching moment here because our faith must be transformational. It should be moving us into a higher sphere in a higher relationship, in revelation and illumination of God. 
However, based on our real life and real time situations, we have uh, gotten away and we have adopted uh, what might be called existential in, entrenchment or the fact that we have engaged in uh, the fact that it's just synonymous with Christianity. Faith has just become a word that is really just synonymous with, with Christianity. We just associate it with being a Christian. Well, I have faith. We go around talking, I have faith. And we'll tell people, have faith. And they okay, I have faith. What does it mean to have faith? Um, too often we have what's called comparative faith. Comparative faith is dangerous uh, simply because we believe what others believe. Which means that if I believe what you believe, then my, my faith must be good faith. Um, which means, uh, do you believe this and I believe that? So therefore, my faith is equal to your faith and it's comparative faith, which means we have to be careful that I don't want your faith. But number one, you may not really have faith. You might just have hope. I don't want the faith that is equivalent to the understanding of your faith because your faith might not have been tried by fire. I need, I need the faith that has been given to me by God. Because let's, let's look at Peter for a moment. Um, Y'all remember the story of Peter on the boat in the middle of the storm? Everybody on that boat had faith. That's right. They all believed that, that boat would keep them in the storm. You didn't hear nobody saying this boat won't save us. They all had the same faith in the boat. They all had the same faith in Jesus. They all had the, an ideology that he could walk on water. They weren't sure. Only one person had transformational faith. And that was Peter that says, bid me to walk on water to come where you are. But he could have had comparative faith. Say, okay, well, let's just stay on the boat. He'll come to us. No. Do you have enough faith to get out of the boat and not have comparative faith that's equal to everybody else who may not have faith in the first place? Then there's conformable faith. Uh, conformable faith simply means um, I'm doing this uh, because of faith, not by faith. See, when we say I'm doing it because of faith, we really don't have faith. We're simply using it as a word that sounds good. Uh, I'm going, I'm going to do this by faith. No, you're just saying it to make it sound Christian, to make it sound spiritual. But are you operating by faith? That's the difference uh, here because a lot of people will say things, I'm going to hang in there by faith. Hmm. Or sometimes faith is we make faith too comprehensible. I said, we, we try to make faith too comprehensible, which means that we try to explain it by, by the human mind. Uh, and if you can fully comprehend faith, it's not faith, it's probably just hope. If somebody can explain to you uh, what faith is and how faith really operates, it's probably just hope. Because I cannot explain the way things have occurred in my life. All I can say, it was nobody but the Lord. It was the hand of God that brought me out, that brought me through, that brought me over, that brought me under, that carried me, that, moved, that, that, that kept me in turbulent times. I can't explain it. I can't explain 
uh, in its totality. As much as I still here trying to tell you even about this building, I cannot explain the full ramification of how a 30 year mortgage got paid off in the future. I cannot explain the whole level of detail because there were things he inserted along the way that I cannot explain. How did you do it, God? I just, he, he just did it. That's why we've come this far by faith. And sometimes faith is just talked about but never realized. Because true faith is we can talk a lot about it, and I can't teach you how to have faith. You have to go through it by faith. You have to go through it and learn what faith is through every little micro and macro experience that God will have you go through. So therefore, I can't really teach it. I can teach about it, but I can't teach you to have faith. I cannot teach you how to give up on the impossible and surrender to the God of all impossibility uh, in order for you to transform your thinking and your thought process. So as we look at the text here, uh, the text is saying uh, now, well, anytime a text is starting out with now, it means that some things have already occurred and transpired that you need to grip hold and grab hold to. So what has already transpired, the writer has let us know that these are many of the reasons that you should have faith in God. So now, uh, the first thing we want to look at in the text is the foundation of faith. Uh, the foundation of faith, and it says uh, faith uh, is, which is the foundation. Faith is the substance, no, which in the Greek is the hypostasis of, 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 it's the very existence. Uh, faith that's spoken of here in the Bible no, is the belief in the word of God, but not knowing how he's going to accomplish what he needs to accomplish. No. Faith is the act uh, of believing what he has written and what he has said and allowing your life to conform to his word. Faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Uh, that word substance, which is translated, which is a, a legal term, which means that it's proof and it's actually going to come about because it's the evidence. Is the proof is going to happen. You don't know how it's going to happen, but it's the truth. Faith simply appropriates the proof. And the proof is the evidence, which is the conviction that we all should have. We should have such a strong conviction in faith that those who walk by faith in the word of God will be the people that have, are the people of conviction. Do you have a strong enough conviction to, to know that when the world says no, that God will still say yes? When the world takes it from you and God still says, I will restore, when your enemy has attacked you and God is still saying, I will repay. Do you have that level of conviction that you don't have to act upon unless he has given you the authority to act upon? Just like David, when he was when his family was attacked in Ziglag, uh, he said, shall I pursue? Uh, uh, he did not pursue until God says, go ahead and pursue. You shall recover. And he did not know how he was going to recover. He didn't know what he was going to recover, but he was simply following the word of God. That's the power of the foundation of faith. The, the other thing I like about faith, faith is, is the, the forecasting of faith because our foundation, the very substratum in which we live and exist upon, must be on faith. That's all we have. The prophets 
had the very presence and the, the essence of God. Even Moses had what was called the theophanies of God. God revealed himself in different ways, the burning bush. We don't have that. The disciples had the physical presence of God in the person of Jesus Christ. We, the only thing we have is faith. So therefore, if we don't have faith, we don't have Christ. We must Another thing about faith, faith is, is to forecast it. Faith allows you to forecast that which you don't see, which means that you can call those things which are not as though they were. The Bible here says that by faith, or by yet meaning by faith, the elders obtain a good report. Because faith, what it will do is it will bring you in a position to be praised of God simply because you trusted in the God that you cannot see. You trust in the God where there was where there is only one way communication. Imagine talking to a human being and there is just one way communication, but you trust that person enough to say, hey, I need you to take me to work tomorrow and, and we need to leave at nine o'clock to go to work. And they just look at you and walk away and don't say anything. But tomorrow morning, you see them getting in the car at nine o'clock because you had one way communication. You didn't get anything back from them. Now, normally in a human uh, platform, you're going to say, did you hear me? Uh, uh, can you do it or can you not do it? If you can't do it, tell me you can't do it. Do we have that kind of conversation with God? No. We say, God, I need you to heal. I need you to bless. I need you to restore. In many cases, it's in all honesty, uh, it's a one-way communication. He will speak back to your inner man every now and again, but mostly you will see the full manifestation of God bringing what you've asked for him to pass. It allows you to forecast. I know what's coming, but I just don't know when. So therefore, it was through faith that we understand, we have an understanding that the world will frame. That's why when man tries to say uh, what he has done through creation, I just look at man no matter how scientific their mind might be. And I just laugh at them. It says, I now know why God made man last. Because we would have claimed we created the animals. We made the, the cows and we gave the dog his bark. We gave the cat his meow. We taught the cat how to meow. I taught that dog how to bark. I taught the eagle how to fly. I'm the one that put the sun in the sky. And if you don't believe that that was possible, they still tried to do some of this with, with the Tower of Babel. Trying to show that they could actually reach the heavens. Hmm. But what faith does, it allows you to forecast because it gives you a perceptive mind that you can be, you can perceive things that the normal human being is not able to perceive, which means that God is in control of all things, regardless to what it, someone may say to you that may counter that, because we have two ways of looking at this. Verse two says, by faith, I know it says by it, but by faith, and then three says, through faith, we have two ways of operating here because in the forecasting of faith, when we see by faith, it's to believe that God can. Uh, you don't know how, you just believe that God can. In the book of Hebrews, the third chapter, around the 17th verse, we see the story of the, he the three Hebrew boys that were thrown into the fiery furnace. I don't like their substratum. I like their foundation. I like their forecasting. They had good foundation and they had good forecasting. They said uh, to Nebuchadnezzar, they said, hey, you know what? We're not going to bow down to you. We don't really care what you do. And 17, it says, if it be so, I'll, uh, if it 
be so. I said, if it be so, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace. I need y'all to understand what they're really saying here. They didn't say God will keep us from going into the furnace. No, no, no. They didn't say God's going to keep us from your hands of destruction. They said God can deliver them out of, go ahead and throw us in, but we know the God we serve is able to deliver us from where? From the fiery furnace, and he will deliver us out of thine hand, O king. But if not, I like this part, even if he does not, my faith is still resolved. My faith is still strong. Be it known unto thee, O king, that we will not serve thy gods, nor worship the golden image which thou hast set up. Do you have that kind of faith where you have the, the foundation and the forecasting that I'm still going to trust in the Lord? I'm still going to believe that God is able to bring us out and to bring us through. That's faith with foundation. That's faith with forecasting. Then we have finishing faith. The thing about finishing faith, you can't get to finishing faith unless you have Foundation and faith. And you can't get the forecasting and faith unless you have foundation and faith. And you can't get the finishing faith unless you have foundation and forecasting. Because you won't finish unless you have good grounding. And you won't finish unless you can see yourself through in regards to how you come through. Because you got to know he's going to bring you through and you will finish regardless of what you're in. Well, when we think about finishing faith, faith helps you to hang in there until God shows up. I always use this expression here. Uh, when someone, uh, you on your way to church and uh, someone, you call someone and say, can you give me a ride to church? And they will say, okay, I will give you a ride. I will pick you up in time for church. And then someone else calls you knowing that you need a ride. And they say, do you need a ride to church? And you will say, no, I have a ride. But the truth of the matter is you don't have a ride. You have a promise and you have patience and you have faith. You don't really have it. You simply are able to articulate it as though you already have it. That's where the forecasting comes in and you're able to hang in there even though you swash other cars come by. You're peeping out the window every time a car pulls up, or you're looking at your watch and wondering, or these days you start texting folks, are you still on your way? Uh, so what you do, you hang in there, and you wait for the ride to come, because you spoke and you articulated that I have a ride. But I want to know how many individuals here today have that good report card, have that good report to say that there have been some tough times, but you're able to say that I hung on in in them and had a finishing faith, and you're able to tell somebody that I trusted in God. And I, let me just give you a couple of examples of individuals in the hall of faith that hung in there and trusted God. According to the Bible, it says that Abel had a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, and he offered unto God, which meant that he had an offering that he gave unto God, an offering is a form of worship. So it meant that Abel had a better form of worship, because remember, worship comes from the heart, and giving comes from the heart. So when you give, you are worshiping, and when you are worshiping, you are giving to God. And that's why God honored Abel's sacrifice more than Cain's sacrifice. So it was because he worshipped him in his giving. He worshipped him in his sacrifice. He worshipped him and through his worship he was able to honor God and he got and, and received a good report. And some of y'all remember Enoch. He's also in the hall of faith. It says that Enoch, I, look, I like to say that 
that he was a conversant because he had so much knowledge of God and he was connected with God that God simply translated him. And there's only two people in the Bible that I recall that did not see that. And one was Enoch and the other one was Elijah was because he was taken up, amen, the chariots of fire. But he, I wanted to stay on Enoch for a moment, that he walked so close to God. My question to you today, are you walking so close to God that you have the knowledge and the faith and the trust and the confidence in God or are you walking closer to the world because you believe in horses and chariots? But do you believe and trust that he's able to do everything that he said uh, that he would do. But see there, not only was it Enoch, not only was it Abel, but they tell me that Noah also had faith in God. Now obviously we know that Noah might have had some issues even before that. And that's good to know that God can use folk that, that have issues beforehand to save an entire generation. Stop letting the devil tell you that God can't use you simply because of who you are. You're able to do the impossible inconceivable. You're able to do the immovable because God's hand is upon you. They tell me that God spoke to Noah in the middle of a messed up generation. And when God spoke to Noah, he warned Noah about things that Noah had never ever seen or even heard of. Noah had never seen rain. He lived in what was called the antediluvian period. He had never seen rain. But God told him, hey Noah, it's going to rain. God, what do you mean? Rain? What, where does it even come from? Does it come from the ocean? Does it come, where does the rain come? It's going to come from the sky and it's going to rain until the entire earth is flooded. I need you to build me an ark. What in the world is an ark? And not only did he have to build an ark, it was the size and the enormous size of this ark that was, they say, equal to almost three football fields in length. I need you to build an ark. And then I need you to bring every animal into the ark for safety and your family into the ark of safety. And Noah said, I don't know about this. How am I going to get all of these animals to come into the ark? God says, now, Noah, there's one thing that you don't know that I know. I'm the one that made the animals and I'm the one that knows how to talk to them. And when I tell them to come to the ark, they're going to come to the ark. And I need you to take them and put them on the ark. All all right, God, if you say so, I'm going to do it. They tell me that Noah followed these plans and the blueprints that God gave him. How many of us are following a plan that God has given you? It does not look right, does not sound right, does not feel. Can I say that one more time? Noah is building something that does not sound right, that does not look right, that does not feel. Let me say it one more time with the Holy Ghost. How many of you can say you're operating and God has caused you to do something? that does not sound right, does not feel right, does not look right, does not smell right, but yet you continue to do what God has called you to do. Some of you, God is calling you to a ministry. He's calling you to a higher level, but your mind has told you it does not look right, does not sound right, does not feel right, so I'm not going to move. That's where you need to move to say, God, I, if it doesn't feel right, I know you got my back. If it does not look right because you said it and decreed it, I'm going to do it. Noah built this ark for the saving of an entire generation. Well, it wasn't just Noah that's in the hall of, of faith. We also talked earlier about Abraham and Sarah. We know that Abraham had some doubts in the beginning, but I need y'all to see how God's grace worked. Because some of you might say, Pastor, I haven't always had faith in God. Pastor, I haven't always trusted in the Lord with all my heart. Well, Abraham didn't always trust in God himself, but look how God used Abraham. You can be restored. You can be recycled. You can be put back in God's righteousness because the same way he used Abraham, he can also use those of you that have that have not always trusted in God. And we found out uh, that Abraham and Sarah were of old age, uh, but God uh, was able to touch him, uh, the womb of Sarah uh, and allow her to give birth uh, to Isaac. Uh, and many of y'all know the story. Uh, from Isaac, there was Esau and Jacob. Uh, and from that generation, 
generation, we bring ourselves on up to the generation where we see the blessed Savior in his name is Jesus. And because of the faith of Abraham and the faith of Sarah, look at what God was able to do. My question to you before I take my seat, how deep is your faith in the Lord? How deep is your faith? Because in order to have deep faith, in order to have sustaining faith, in order to have saving faith, in order to have transformational Faith. You gotta dig uh, until you get to solid rock, uh, and that solid rock, uh, his name uh, is Jesus. Uh, upon uh, this solid rock, uh, I stand. Uh, it is not faith, uh, it's sinking sand. Uh, how many of you uh, could say uh, that you indeed, uh, without question, you will trust him, uh, in the Lord uh, until you die? Uh, trust when it don't feel right. Uh, trust when it doesn't look right. Uh, trust when it doesn't smell right. Uh, trust when it doesn't even uh, appear to be right. Uh, but you say, God, if you said it, I believe it. God, if you decreed it, I'm going to follow it. God, if it's in your word, I'm going to do it. Because the same faith that we share today is the faith that will anchor us and get us to glory. How deep is your faith? Is it superficial? Is it based on someone else's faith? And if it is, I pray for you today to not have comparative faith. You don't want to have faith that's equal to someone else. That's like having a share of somebody else's testimony. Your faith in God is your faith in God. But it must be deep enough to survive life. Because all of the individuals that are listed in the Hall of Faith, I'll be preaching for the next 30 minutes if I try to go through the Hall of Faith. We preached about Rahab a couple weeks ago. A woman of the red light district, a woman of the world. But she still had enough faith don't let mankind nor your family nor anybody around you tell you that you can't have faith in God. He will use any and everybody if you allow him to entrench you with faith. And if you don't have it, ask God for it. Don't try to copy it off of somebody else. Don't try to use somebody else's faith story. You can share somebody else's faith testimony, but don't try to use their story as your understanding of faith. God, again, used imperfect people to do his perfected work. These were regular old folk. Regular old folk. But the devil has convinced some of us that we've lived this far without trusting God. Why, why change now? Um, Moses lived to be almost 80. Abraham was what, 100? Uh, uh, don't y'all try to wait that long. But even if you haven't operated in faith, let today be the day that you say, God, you said in your word, all I need to start the faith process is the, the size of a mustard seed, which is small, but yet powerful. Small, but powerful. All of you have faith in something, but make sure you have faith in God. And please, 
Stop questioning God about faith in him. Because none of us question this chair. When I sit down in this chair, I plop my behind right in this chair. You know why? I have faith that these four legs are going to hold me up. But this is how we do God. Hey, can you come sit in this chair? I need to see first that he's real. No. We have more faith in God, more faith, more faith in the chair than we do in God. We have faith in your gas needle. You know E stands for empty. But you, that little, most cars now had a little warning light on. You have more faith in that warning light than you do from this warning light. This is a big warning light. Tells us how to live, how to do right, how to correct, how to feel, when we need to fill ourselves up. But you be like, oh no, I got, I know it's on E, but the warning light says I have at least two gallons left. And if any of y'all are that good, to calculate what two gallons are going to do in a car that's getting 20 miles to the gallon, that's good for you. What I'm getting at is look at the level of brain power and faith you are putting into a car. But we won't give God even half of that to trust in him. And don't say, please, some of y'all sitting there saying, well, I, I, I pray to God that he will get me to the gas station. That's called hope. You are hoping that there is enough gas in this gas tank. Amen. Amen. God bless you. May the peace and power of God be with you. We open doors of discipleship. May we all stand at this time. Might there be someone in the sanctuary or and online? If you're not giving your life to Jesus Christ, this is your opportunity to surrender your life to Christ. If you're giving your life to Jesus Christ and you do not have a church home, and you need a new, you need a church home, a place where you can come and grow and drop your anchor. You can drop your anchor here in this community church where you can learn more about Jesus Christ and be a devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. If you're online, just type into the chat and say, I need Jesus. I need a place where I can learn more about my Lord and my Savior. Again, if you're online, just type into the chat and say, hey, I, I've surrendered my life to Jesus Christ. And again, what we love about Christ, he does not wait for us to get ourselves ready. We surrender ourselves to him the way we are. If you've been a part of this ministry and drifted away for a period of six months or more, and you want to reestablish, reacquaint yourself with each community church, this opportunity is going out to you at this time. Everybody's saved. Everybody's connected with the body of Jesus Christ. Anybody online? All online are okay. All right. God bless you. We hope and pray that his word has found you well. Again, we need to make sure we have the right foundation, the platform called faith. Faith gives you the ability to forecast and speak through storms and to say, I'm on my way out. I don't know how he's going to bring me out, but I know I'm on my way out. And it allows you to finish. We need to be finishers. Particularly in the house of God, the devil messes with our faith to the point where we don't finish because we can't see our way out. I think about I think about Noah and the fact that it took him over a hundred years to build that ark. Um, hundred, I'm sorry, hundred days. Hundred twenty-four years 
Thank you, Sunday school teacher. Uh, 124 years. Let me tell y'all something. Um, I'm gonna put that maybe our terms of, of age because obviously we don't live that long now. That's probably equal to about 70 years. If I'm doing something for 70 years and it ain't finished, matter of fact, probably about 70 days. This thing not finished in 70 days? I quit. I'm gonna punch the clock. I'm just keeping it real. Most of us would not be that consistent with the Lord. Because when it comes to ministry, when it comes to what we've been called to do, there is no quit. There may be transformation and secession, but there is no quit. Um, and it's because we just don't see, we don't see God in it anymore. 120 something years. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Not just friends, not just friends. He had family laughing at him. Because if you all don't, don't see yourself in the story of Noah, you don't you won't never you'll never see yourself. Because every time you are in worship and Bible study, you are building your ark. And people are laughing at you. Why are you in church every Sunday? Why are you in Bible study? Why are you doing all that stuff for the church? Uh and then they would they would taunt you and say, "Why are you doing all that stuff for man? Why are you doing all that stuff for the pastor? They don't care. They they, they don't they, they don't appreciate you." Well, I'm not the one that you need appreciation from because you're doing it for the Lord. So I'm pretty sure Noah had to deal with all of this, and all of this stuff gets in our mind. We all are Noahs building an ark, hopefully for the saving of our family, but you ultimately build in an ark. In order to get home to glory. Amen. Because remember Noah is just an archetype. For Jesus Christ. Amen. Well, God bless you. Again we hope that everyone is, is connected with Jesus Christ. And most importantly. That you're in relationship. And not religion. God bless you. Let us all pray. Heavenly gracious Father. In the name of Jesus Christ. And Father we thank you. We praise you, Lord God, for this is another opportunity, Lord God, to be in your house of worship, Lord God, to hear your word, Lord God, on the subject of faith. We ask and pray, Lord God, that your word, Lord God, will fall upon good and fertile ground, Lord God, and that we will leave here, Lord God, to share it and determine, Lord God, to be stronger and stronger and stronger in our faith. Because we know that, Lord God, when we're going through, you don't pull us out with our hands and our feet. You pull us out and through based upon the power of our faith. Increase our faith. It is in Christ Jesus' name we pray and we thank you. Amen. God bless you.